Greetings and welcome back to Old Ways Rising Farm on a beautiful early fall day where we're telling a story which begins as many do here on the farm with me standing in a hole in the ground. We're going to be making a large, full-scale, full tall Hugo culture mound today. Well, it'll take more than just today to do. This is a long process. Previously on the channel, we have done small-scale Hugo cultures and we've done double digging. All three of these methods are related in the fact that they start with a trench and you're focusing on burying organic matter so that it can store water. Okay. The full scale Hugo culture mound, instead of just being a little knee high, you know, short raised bed, these are four to six feet tall. Mine's going to be about four feet tall. What is the advantage to doing this? It's obviously a whole lot more work. What's the advantage? Well, it provides a windbreak. Okay? So our prevailing winds here in New York come from the west. That's to my right as I'm facing the camera. Okay? So from the wheelbarrow to me and then off toward the garden. So if I put a windbreak here, that will mitigate the desiccating effects of those winds and will help protect the plants in the lee of the wind in their own double dug beds from that desiccation and help maximize the water that have been stored in those double dug beds. At the same time, since the majority of the matter in this mound is going to be decaying wood, it will store a tremendous amount of water in place and will be a garden in and of itself. Okay. Why did I choose to do this now instead of earlier? Well, we've been here three years and we're applying one of the core permaculture concepts of observe and respond to the stimuli that you observe. We have had three very dry years and it's showing us that this ground is prone to drought. It's a silty clay at the edge of a hill, so it's sort of an excessively drained site to begin with. And the soil has been highly degraded by very poor agriculture. So most of the organic matter is gone from it. It just does not store water well at all. So in these drought years, it's extraordinarily dry. And even, in, even with the best bed prep, the crops struggle. So we are expanding the best bed prep and doing some things like this, these windbreaks, to help mitigate the desiccating effect of the wind and maximize the effect of all that hard work in those double dug beds. Okay, The one behind me, that's potatoes, that is double dug. This will be double dug by next year. So doing this here in the fall, making this windbreak is going to give us another strip of more than double dug ground with a lot of water stored and help protect those downwind beds. So let's talk about how we produce this. Now the first step in doing this is dig a trench. I've already dug this trench. This is only half as long as what it will eventually end up being, but I do recommend doing this in small chunks. One good chunk done well is better than trying to lay the whole thing out at once and not really getting any of it done properly. Okay, So we will pick our way along. We will do it a bit at a time. This is about one quarter of the trench that I will need to dig for this total bed. We're going to start here and we'll work through it. This is going to be a multi-week project. There's absolutely nothing fast or easy about this, but it is worth it. Now, I dug the trench off camera because you don't need to watch me digging a trench. That's boring. What I do want to show is what we're going to do in the bottom of the trench. And I have showed this previously and the double digging and hugel culture beds. But any time you've taken the time to dig a trench and expose this lower layer of soil, especially when it's a hard pan like mine is, we want to, to do another step, break up that soil, loosen that all up, okay? Loosen that all up. I do like to do this with the digging bar. You can also do this with a pick. 
I recommend you don't do it with a shovel. Shovels are for moving loose soil, not for making it. Now, we're going to take some organic material. I'm using castall bedding as I always do because it's available, it's readily available to me and free. You can use compost. You can use other forms of manure. You can use horse patooties. You can use whatever you like. It's not important what it is other than the fact that it is organic carbon. So the whole goal is to get organic carbon down here. And now I'm going to flip all of this and mix that organic material in. No matter how deep you dig your trench, I always recommend that you do this step. You're never going to see this soil again. And this is one of those times where you only have one chance to do it right the first time. I know, believe me I know, by the time you get this trench dug, you're sick of digging and just want to move on to the next step. Resist that temptation. I want a little more in there. It's looking real poofy right now. Real fluffed up, but it is going to collapse with all the weight that we're going to put on top of it till this is all done. Okay. Do not cheat this step. Yes? It's extra work. You can hear I'm a little out of breath because I've been digging all day. But don't cheat this step. You will never regret doing it. There are times where I've cheated this step and I live to regret not doing it because then I ended up wasting all of that other effort because the bed wasn't done right. Mm. Do it right the first time, you won't regret it. Now, you're never going to have to touch this again. This is a once and done method. It's worth it to do it right the first time. So I'm going to follow my own advice. I'm going to proceed down this trench, digging this manure in, and then we'll join together for the next step. So I went all the way down the trench. I have dug in the organic material, that castall bedding. So now we have organic matter in the lowest possible level as deep as we're ever going to get in this run and we're never going to have another run, right? So again, always drive organic matter as deep as possible. The next addition is our rotten wood. And this is really what makes Hugel culture distinct from other soil prep methods. And what we want to take advantage of is this. So this is just some shreds. And if I wring these out, look at that water dripping out of them. Right? That's pretty dramatic. This is why this sort of prep stores so much water because this material is such a good sponge. The second thing that's working in our favor can be shown over here. If I take this piece of bark, look at that lovely mycelial mat. These beautiful, beautiful fungi. Since we're using wood that is already well advanced in decay, we're inoculating the soil with a large diversity of natural beneficial microorganisms that are adapted to this site because they came from right here. Now, you won't always be able to see it as vividly as this, but it's there. You can know it's there. As we lay our, our sticks in, we want to start with the biggest stuff first and try to pack it in to get it all stuffed in here as close as possible. Okay, big stuff first. And this is just a simple geometry problem. If you put your big material in first, it's no big deal to pack the little stuff around it. You put your little stuff in first, you don't have room for your big stuff. Okay. Right. 
And then as we get the big stuff laid in, we'll take the littler stuff and do just what I said, pack it in around the big stuff. The big old log. Okay. And you do want to take the time to try and make this as neat and tidy as you can. Because we want to get as much of this woody material in as possible. Do the next row down. Again, you're never going to touch this again, so this is your one chance to do it right the first time. Now that I have my big stuff in there, in goes the little stuff. And for this layer, I'm only trying to fill in the trench. I'm not trying to go up above it. Little stuff. More little stuff. And now it's time to go back out into the woods for more stuff. Okay, so just a little bit of a progress update. Um, took all of yesterday evening and finished filling up this trench and getting it packed in as close and tight as I can with the sticks. Now we're ready to do the next step, which is fertilize and work some soil into these. So I have a collection of things here that I'm going to put down to add to the fertility of this because the wood has no inherent fertility of its own. Okay. The first is bone meal. So bone meal is a nice source, slow release source of phosphate and calcium. Okay. Now anywhere I put down manure, I'm not going to add any bone meal because it needs no additional phosphate. But here around these sticks, I want to put some down to work some of that phosphate into the sticks. You only really need to do this once. Once you have enough phosphate on your site, you pretty much have it forever. But I do want to do this once, and I do want to put it directly on top of the sticks because I want it to filter down through. Okay? And in fact, I'm going to take my shovel, kind of tap on it a little bit to help it filter on down through. I want that working in around. Okay. Now, the next thing I want to add is some of this native soil back in. Okay. Again, we got potato in here. Catch on. There we go. Spud. One that got missed from the picking. And I want to work this down in and get that down in all of the air pockets. A couple reasons for this. One is to encourage worm activity. Bioturbation is a very important thing here. It's going to help take this organic matter as it decays and work it deeper and wider through the soil. Okay? But we need happy worms in order for that to happen. Secondly, you want some of that clay mixed in with the organic matter. Developing your optimum soil tilth isn't just a function of getting rid of clay, but having a, a mixture of the clay and the organic matter. Okay. So we want some of that in there so we can get those nice little aggregates of the clay acting as a glue 
helping retain moisture, helping retain nutrients, absorbing all of these fertilizers that we're going to put down, and working it in. Now, if you are a biochar person, I would put down a good measure of that before we put the soil down, get that worked in as well. So you have deep organic matter, it's not going anywhere. This would be a great place to put down some biochar. I don't have any. I don't think it's strictly necessary in our climate, but it is a good thing. I am not knocking it by any stretch of the imagination. Okay. Good. It's about all that I'm going to be able to wiggle down in there. Piece of plastic. Who knows how that got in there, but we'll pick up the litter when we find it. Okay. There. Now, I don't want to lose all of the soil that's bound up in this sod, so we'll chuck that down upside down here. And it's going to be very thoroughly covered and very thoroughly smothered. It's not going to live. And if any of it does, this is going to get squash on it next year, so it won't last long. just do a little patch here to show you and of course I will work this all the way down now next thing we're gonna do sprinkling of Epsom salts just a small handful little light sprinkle that is magnesium sulfate so that's some micronutrients again as I've said before in other videos the key part of say of the word micronutrient is micro you only need a little okay now we have phosphate we're not going to worry about nitrogen yet it won't be here till spring anyway and this is fall prep we need some potash for that I'm going to put down some um, kitty you don't want this I promise <laughs> we're gonna put down some wood ashes a little coating And then we're going to put down some dolomitic limestone. Again, this has some magnesium in it and some other trace nutrients. So this is calcium and trace nutrients. And I'm putting this on top of the soil because this stuff will all dissolve and I want the uh, wood to catch it. Whereas the bone meal will not dissolve and I want it mixed through the whole column. That's why I'm doing it in this order. And that's all I'm doing for fertilizer. We have the magnesium sulfate salt and we have the salts in the wood ashes, right, the potash. I'm not putting down any additional salt-based fertilizers. Um, depending on what we end up doing in the spring, there might be a little bit of ammonium sulfate here. We'll see. We'll see. We'll take that as it comes. But for now, for this early prep, that's all I'm going to do. The uh, wood... As these fertilizers start to dissolve and percolate down through, the wood is going to catch it. So it won't be allowed to percolate all the way down to the bottom. That's why I want it up a layer. And now, to top it all off, worm food. This is aged cast stall bedding, just like I used in the bottom level. I don't know exactly, but from the looks of it, this is going on a year old. We're going to put a nice top dressing of worm food. And this is also why I'm not putting any bone meal up top here because this has plenty of phosphate in it. Okay? We'll encourage our worms to come in. Worm food. There we go. get 
can see I'm not sparing the worm food. Nice heavy mulch. Now, if this were a short, low level hugel culture, I just bring another layer of soil and then another layer of the compost, soil, compost, soil, compost, till I was out of the dirt. And we'd have a mound about that tall. Okay? But I want this to be about chest high. So we're going to keep going with another level of sticks, but I'm going to work my way all the way through the, all the way down through the trench, and then we'll rejoin when I'm ready for more sticks. Okay, so this trench has been filled in. We took the manure compost all the way back to the end, and we're ready for the next layer. Now, as we build this, you need to keep in mind that for this to be stable, it's going to have to slope at about 45 degrees, the sides because you have to mind your angle of repose. This is one of the pieces of garden architecture that you build at the natural angle of repose. Um, I did a whole video on this talking about the theory behind laying stone walls that will actually stay up. I'll put a little link in the caption below to that video if you want a little more explanation of that geometry. But for now, short of the long is, if I want this little mound to be about shovel high, I also need it to be about shovel wide. Okay? So this ditch isn't quite wide enough. That's okay. You can extend over your ditch a little bit. We have this big water storing sump. Um, normally, I would just kind of center this and say, okay, I'll just go one log out on either side. But because this, where the wheelbarrow is there and where the shovel is pointing is a path I need to get the lawnmower through, I'm just going to favor one side as I do this. Okay? So getting started with the next level is, again, I'm just going to kind of fill in here with some sticks. Kind of bring this up to a good spot to start. Making sure I pack this nice and tight. Need some little shorties for this end. This is just about getting a nice level flat spot. Okay. So that's just filling in that little gap. And now I'm going to turn 90 degrees set the next batch of sticks this way. In such a way that they're woven together and I'm extending across this whole area. And you don't have to be perfect with this, but you do want to get them kind of nested in a bit so that they're going to sit well. Because we don't want to put all this effort in and then have the whole thing roll apart. That would make us sad. And again, I've said it before, I'll say it again. There's enough sadness in the news. We don't want to be sad because a project fell apart. And we're just going to work on building this up with sticks until it's all around about knee high. Then we'll go back through with fertilizer, soil, more fertilizer, and then another layer of compost. So I'm going to work on this a while, and we'll rejoin when I've made some more progress. We have made some progress. We have built the stick mound up to about boot high. On top of that, again, we have another layer of the native soil so that we have some mineral content in here. And then on top of that, a capping of the compost mulch. 
the fertilizer regimen is exactly the same as the first tier that you saw in preceding clip. We have some bone meal directly on top of the sticks because they're very, they're going to be very, very deficient in the phosphate. So I want that to filter down through. And then we have a mixture. We have the wood ashes. We have the, the lime and we have a very light sprinkling of the Epsom salts here on top of the soil. And then the mulch capping it all off. That's our second tier. And this is right about knee high, about where I wanted it to be. Let's talk about the third tier. And that is, as I'm sure you can surmise by the wheelbarrow behind me, more sticks. So we're gonna keep building this up. And every tier, notice that every tier, I'm orienting the sticks in a different direction. That has to do with stability of the pile. So I'm going to build sticks up as high as I can without losing stability. This height will be whatever it is. Physics will determine that for me. I want to get it as tall as I can get it, but it has to be stable at the same time. So I'm going to keep working on this. So this mound is for all intents and purposes finished. Um, it's piled up with the compost back there. I left the stick stick out here for this last video clip so that you could see the full architecture. Now on the back side, where I'm allowing the compost to build up the deepest, I put one more row of, of loose sticks there. That's mostly just to armor it against the scratching of chickens. They do a wonderful ecosystem service for us in the eating of slugs, which otherwise wipe everything out. We have a big slug problem here. But I don't want to have to remount this mound eight times between now and when I want to plant it. So it's got some armor on the backside. If you don't have chickens, that's not strictly necessary. Okay. But this is the finished mound. This last load of manure behind me is going to go up here as soon as we finish the video. This is about half the length that I want. Um, I'm going to build another 20 feet down that way behind me. But you want to do this in small bite-sized chunks. This is a lot of work. It's better to have half of it done well than to try and lay out way too much and end up never finishing it. Okay. The uh, nice thing about this is that it is a windbreak. Windbreaks will pile snow. I'm counting on charging this with water from the winter snowfall. So as the wind comes in the winter and, and drifts snow up on it, there will be a little bit of snow packed as a sort of a packed cordis into the side where I'm sitting. I'm sitting on the windward side. But on the leeward side, this will induce swirling winds, which will spin out and drop a large drift. That large drift is right over the backside of the mound and on the gardens that I'm trying to irrigate. So in a sense, I'm using wind power to irrigate my gardens in a system with no moving parts. And that's a win, okay? Um, on the subject of thumbs up, I hope you'll give this video one if you're enjoying it. It really helps the algorithm know to show it to others. Thank you very much for doing that. And this idea of filling it with water brings us to the last thing that I want to talk about, which is context, where this fits and where it doesn't fit. A sponge does two things. It absorbs water and it releases water. It has to absorb water before it releases water. If water is limited, it will try to absorb everything that it can get and not release any. You have to keep that in mind. We're building a sponge. The object of this method is to store water when it's in excess and then slowly release it when it's deficient. But there has to be a period of excess for that to work. Here, the greatest period of excess is the spring melt. This method was developed in Germany, where that statement is also true. But this is very much a wet, temperate adaptation. Okay? Even in our droughtiest years, we still have good snowfall, and we still have at least a month and a half or two months of rainy season in the spring and the fall. So even in this horrifically dry year that we've had this year, the last month has been wet. It missed the growing season when we really needed it, but it has been wet. 
So that will start to charge this. The snow melt will finish the charge and the wet spring will maintain the charge. And then if we have two or three months of dry summer, that water will be here and available for the plants. This does not work well in Mediterranean climates where you don't have a monsoon and you don't have a sufficiently wet rainy season to fully charge all of this sponge. If you're in a Mediterranean climate, you want to think more double digging. If you want the function of a windbreak, make a different windbreak. Okay? So if you're watching this from the Levant, look around you and see all of those stone walls that are planted with rosemary. Do that. Do that for your windbreak and then put double dug beds on the leeward side. If you're watching from California or Arizona, learn for, from our Levantine friends. Do a dry planted wall for your windbreak and then double dug on the leeward side in the, in the protection of that windbreak. Wet temperate regions, this can be very good. This could also be very good in dry regions with a very strong monsoon. Because again, you'll have enough water to charge it up and then you have the passive water storage to mitigate the dry season and extend the time of year during which you can grow your plants. Can still be good there. But if you're in a true dry forest, chaparral, Mediterranean climate, don't do this. It's too much sponge. It's going to do more harm than good. Okay? Context matters. Also, context matters in terms of material availability. You see the size of this mound, and you see the wheelbarrow which brought it all in. It's about a three cubic foot wheelbarrow, just for context. So, this is a big deal. This is a lot of trips with a wheelbarrow and a lot of organic matter brought in. So the vast majority of this just came from the woods around me and I haven't schlepped anything more than 100 yards. I'm sorry, 100 feet. If you're in suburbs where you don't have this resource, this again might not be the right method for you. Go and buy in enough compost to double dig your bed and then again revert to another method of producing a windbreak. You can still have all of the functionality of this system that respects your locally available resources. So think about all of those things when you're doing this. Also think about your own physical fitness and what you can manage in terms of exertion. This is no small feat making one of these. It's more than twice the work of double digging. You get extra functionality out of the system, but it's still more than twice the work of double digging, which is already labor intensive. So if you don't have the joints or the energy level to do this, either do it in very small segments so that you don't start feeling overwhelmed, or do a different method that's a little easier on loose joints, we'll say right so think about all of those things your goal isn't just to replicate somebody else's garden method your goal is to find the optimum most resilient garden method for you in your context but i hope that this does give you some food for thought i hope that it shows the method well and i hope that you will join us next time here at old ways rising farm have a wonderful blessed day